todo. It seemed that Western business ruled the world. This is a familiar sight. Western commerce and culture exported to other countries. But that's not the whole story anymore. We really have lost a lot of the political and economic leverage we used to have overseas. We used to call the shots in a way that we just no longer can. We have to take much more seriously than we used to the ways of doing business in the foreign countries, uh, their particular values, their own priorities, their preferences. We find that other ways of managing people are getting attention now. Our ways of organizing a business or um, our ways of marketing um, no longer are the only ways in the world. We're learning from other countries and when we go abroad especially we must learn how they do things, not only because they may do things better, but even if they don't do things better, they may have very fundamental cultural reasons for doing them the way they do it. Many countries are now in a position to demand that we respect them, respect their requirements, their needs, and if we don't, they can always go to the Germans, to the Japanese, to somebody else. So it's uh, much more highly competitive, much more demanding upon us, and we're having to accommodate, adjust, adapt much more exactly to them. International organizations have hundreds of thousands of employees abroad. In many cases, these people are on important missions in new and unfamiliar surroundings. The challenge of going international is great, and the costs involved make this very serious business indeed. Whether you're going abroad for a company or for your government or as a missionary or even just as an emissary of goodwill, you take with you a goal, a goal important to your career and to your self-esteem. But when you get in a foreign context, how you achieve that goal becomes the real issue. We go overseas as representatives of our own background. So when I step off the plane in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia or Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, I have a plaque on my forehead that says, made in the USA by Americans. And initially, that's what they respond to, the nationals of that country. We Americans like to think of ourselves as self-made people, separate from nature. We talk about harnessing the forces of nature. We talk about mastering our environment. Most of the peoples of the world see themselves as a part of nature very much subject to the same forces that, for example, a tree is. What determines the size, the shape, the character of that tree? The environment in which it grew up, the sun, how much rain it's gotten, the soil in which the roots are located, the constant force of the wind. From the time this is just a seedling up on the exposed ridge, that wind is shaping this tree into the beautiful form that it has now. See, that's what culture is. From the first time we set foot on this earth, from the people around us, from the language, from the room, and from our schools, our organizations, we are being shaped. Not aware of it at all. Now, let's say this tree has grown up here, it fits the environment, it belongs here, and we come along and we uproot it. It goes through transplant shock. If we take a person plant, say from New York to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, it's going to go through the same transplant shock. So we look at this soil 
we understand what's important to the growth and maintenance of this tree. And what's important to us? Let's be sure that we take it with us. We pot it and take it with us. We have the new location over here. The hole is dug. The ground has to be properly prepared. That's the organization's responsibility. Be sure there's lots of water. And for a while, that tree was going to need some extra support. How can we, as a family, support one another until we set down our roots in this new soil? There is no doubt that almost everything about the world, other than gravity and temperature, is shaped by the way we think as cultural beings. Whether even the weather is good or bad can in fact be a product of how we, as raised in a particular culture, view what is good and bad about the weather. We know this to be true of the of farmers as opposed to beach lovers down in Florida. Um, it's also true of most everything else. Take, for example, a kiss. If you look at movies from different cultures, you'll find that some of them have men and women kissing a great deal. Those would tend to be American and European movies. If you look at movies from India or movies from Japan, you find that affection is expressed in totally different ways. And we do know that many peoples around the world, when they first experienced Hollywood movies with a kiss, thought of it as very unsanitary and rather crude way of expressing a feeling or affection. <laughs> Culture affects the way we greet each other. Good, how you see it? Fine, how was your trip? It affects how we dress. What and how we eat. Most of the time, we are unaware that much of what we do is learned behavior. There we go. We assume our normal way of doing things is the only way. It's only when we step outside that we notice differences and experience the need to learn the skills of intercultural interaction. And when we travel abroad, we carry our cultural baggage. This includes our assumptions, goals, ways of relating, and prejudices about other people in the world. Once leaving the shores of the United States, we are Americans. And I think it can be a fallacy to assume, because I am a, a minority, be that black, Asian, Hispanic, and I go into another country, I am going to have a, an easier time. That I may or may not have an easier time. I may run into the same cultural barriers that any other American runs into, unless I really take some time to understand and learn about that culture. Human thought in general depends on uh, generalizations. One kind of generalization is a stereotype. It's a, a negative thing because it's too narrow and it's too constraining in our own abilities to work with people. What is a stereotype? What really does, does that word mean? It comes from printing, when they would take the type and they would put a mold on it, pull off the mold, and they would make a metal plate. And then they run the same plate over and over again, and you get the same page every time. Now, the danger when applied to us human beings is that we take a few facts that we know about somebody or about a people, and then we just apply it over and over again to everybody. That's stereotype. A stereotype is a lazy way of categorizing people, of taking what would purport to be group characteristics and putting them on an individual. Oh, he or she is like that because they belong to a particular category, a particular group. Women act like that. Blacks are like that. You know, Mexicans really are like that. If we say all um, Spaniards are lazy because they uh, go home for a siesta and they come back uh, um, late in the afternoon to the office, we are limiting our abilities to ever understand which Spaniards are really the great workers and which Spaniards may not be the great workers. So if I go into Saudi Arabia or I go into Japan and I think Japanese are like this, 
First, it's a very simplified picture I have, only partially accurate. And the tendency is to, to force everybody into that mold, so I misunderstand. And they resent it, of course. We don't like to be stereotyped ourselves. Americans in foreign countries have the tendency to treat the natives as foreigners, and they forget, actually, that they are the foreigners themselves. They get too pushy. They want that job to be done instantly, like in America. Perhaps the commonest mistake that Americans make is to be a little boastful about America and to overstate their own accomplishments. For example, if a Britisher had reached the semi-finals at Wimbledon, he might claim to play a little tennis. An American who had taken an elementary course in French, on the other hand, might claim to speak the language fairly well. They are uh, kind of impatient, and sometimes they don't take the time to mix the feelings of the heart with the feelings of the, of the head. I think American businessmen have a tendency uh, to think that uh, what you can do in the United States, you can do in the rest of the world. That's a misconception. Um, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. You know, you have to be. When if you're in Japan, you've got to do the Japanese way. I think all of us, to one degree or, or another, if we are honest, are clearly prejudiced. That we have likes, we have dislikes, we have assumptions that we make. But I think the key thing to understanding one's prejudices, particularly as you begin to deal with people from another group, would be to begin to examine basic assumptions. Do I make assumptions about that person based on that person being part of a category? Or am I making assumptions about that person based on that individual and that individual interaction? Many people who go overseas fall into traps because they stereotype. We can't help but see other cultures through filters imposed by our own upbringing and learned ways of thinking. Take cleanliness, for example. Americans consider themselves to be the cleanest people on earth. And judging by the variety of cleaning products available, you could say it amounts to a national obsession. Americans are quick to criticize the sanitary practices they find abroad. Yet, when Americans bathe, they soak, wash, and rinse in the same water, even though they wouldn't think of doing their laundry or dishes that way. Some people consider the American way unclean and offensive. The Japanese use different water for each step. They actually rinse off before getting into the bath and again afterwards. This is a typical American bathroom but other cultures find it unhygienic. Bath, sink, and toilet in the same room. Some Western travelers are offended by the facilities they find. But isn't it cleaner not to touch the toilet? And these kinds of differences are truly cultural. Um, it's not that one is necessarily better than the other, but it is important to realize that people grow up learning different ways of seeing fundamental things. The time is 11, 29. And 10 seconds. Americans think of time as something tangible and valuable. They say time is money. They spend it, waste it, save it, budget it, and hate to run out of it. In Hong Kong, there's a very unique thing. Uh, appointments are, there's, are, are spread out over time. It's not uncommon for someone to be 20 minutes, a half an hour late, and not think twice about it. The traffic situations are so difficult that you can never quite plan. Chances are you're going to run into a traffic jam, and if you anticipate a traffic jam, then you wind up being an hour early. So people are very tolerant of, of times in that kind of an environment. There's no feeling of uh, that they have to go to a meeting at a specified time. They specify a time, but it's almost as though it's uh, part of their image that they shouldn't be there right then, you know, keep them waiting. And it doesn't matter, it's not necessarily uh, North Americans that they're keeping waiting, it's other Venezuelans. You go to the, the Emir's house in Saudi, for instance, uh, to negotiate a labor contract or, or a work hour variance. You drink a little tea, and then you drink a little coffee, and then you might talk a little, and then you might drink a little more tea. I went one time to a meal there at the end of Ramadan, the classic meal where they, had, they brought in the goat, and the rice, and we sat on the floor and we chatted and we talked. And 
it took me about nine hours to get a, a work hour variance because we wanted to go to an extended work schedule. So there's a lot more emphasis on the ceremony than there is on the finished product. Perceptions of time have great impact on other aspects of life. It affects how people regard the past and the future. Some cultures worship progress, change, and plans. It makes them impatient negotiators and exasperating people to do business with. In some places, innovation is distrusted. Patience is a mark of strength, and tradition is revered. Change of any kind comes slowly, and schedules are ignored. Space. Personal space. We all have this bubble around us, and we don't want it to be invaded, and we get very uncomfortable if it is. Japanese, for example, like to keep a fair amount of distance between themselves. They're comfortable about that distance there. Americans, about 17 inches. And the way to test that is if I'm an American here talking with another American, he's going to be exactly far enough away that I could put my thumb in his ear. Try it. Next time you're talking to an American, he will be that far away. Huh? What about an Arab? He's comfortable about here. Many Latin Americans are more comfortable closer. So here's this Arab who's walked up to me like that, which I feel to be too close. So then, of course, I step back. What does he feel? Well, I'm rejecting him a bit, perhaps. Perception of space affects how offices are laid out around the world. Americans value individuality and typically divide their space into many private domains. The higher one's rank in the organization, the more lofty and isolated one becomes. Compare this to the Japanese office. Everything is wide open, one big family room. Everyone can see and hear what everyone else is doing. If we're going to communicate accurately with someone, we have to understand the patterns of their thinking. And we can get some glimpse of that if we look at how they work, how they talk. If we take an American, for example, and he or she is there, and they want to go there, how do they do it? just as directly as possible. Bam, 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 one step at a time, right? The shortest distance, most efficient. All right, now how does a Saudi think? Well, let's listen to him talk. He starts here, he wants to get there too, but he's gonna get there a very different way. Not just Saudis now, many people in Latin America, other parts of the world. We start here. And before we get on with the business, like we're eager to do, they're going to loop. They're going to talk, for example, about the last time I saw you, so and so like that. So there's a, this establishing the, the contact with the person. Once that's established, then things are warmed up. You know, we warm up machines before we start them. We don't very often think about <laughs> warming up our relations before you. So the Saudi then will talk about the business for a while. But then, sure enough, he loops again. Tell me something about what happened last week. He'll come back to the business at hand, but then he will loop again. For example, a friend comes by. He does get there, but you see, it's a very different pattern. All right, now all that we do, you see, is geared to this. The way we negotiate, the way, for example, we set up a training program very linear. Now what happens if we take a training program designed for people who think and who learn like this and we put somebody who thinks like this into it? We just cut off their loops. Language. I had a Japanese who came to me one day and said, Dorman san, what does maybe mean in English? He said, I know what it means in Japanese. Maybe means no in Japanese. But what does it mean in English? Does it mean maybe or does it mean no? In the Philippines, I found that um, people will say yes all the time to you, um, and they don't necessarily mean yes, that they could, they are just being polite, that they're saving face for themselves because they don't want to say, no, I won't do that, and they're saving face for you because they don't want you to feel badly. We Westerners, especially Americans, assume that most of our meaning can be put into words. So we're very careful in shaping our words, and we listen very carefully to the words. 
But of course, a great deal, maybe 60 or 70 percent of what we communicate has nothing to do with the words at all. It's the tone of our voice, our gestures, all of this. The meaning of the person that you're conveying to others, are you a warm, understanding, patient person? Or are you someone that's hurried, uh, not interested in their point of view, or um, always feeling on the defensive? These things are conveyed by the style. Advertisements reveal a great deal about uh, people. We build into our advertisements without even thinking about it, our basic values and ways of looking at the world. IBM's Charlie Chaplin Lookalike and Red Roses have won awards in the U.S., but in Europe, Red Roses mean different things, and the little tramp has a different image. So, IBM created cartoon characters to better appeal to French, Italian, German, and other markets. When Coca-Cola first entered China, signs were provided in English. Local shopkeepers wrote their own calligraphy, which unfortunately translated, Bite the Wax Tadpole. Coke researched 40,000 characters and found a close equivalent, Ke Ko Ke Le, which translates roughly, May the Mouth Rejoice. Our basic business is marketing consumer products commodity-oriented products like detergents or soft drinks to the world market. In doing that, we have to be extremely sensitive to each national culture. For example, this beer is made in Japan but sold all over the world. In Hong Kong and Singapore, we had to change the package to green because blue was thought of as funereal to the Chinese. We also had to change the red star because the red suggested the People's Republic of China. This corporate eagle that we designed for the second largest bank in Mexico was very well received, except the eagle was perceived as American until we put a top knot on it, which the Mexicans perceived as being Mexican. For Saudis and for many peoples of the world, the bottom of the foot is dirty. To put this lowest part of the body in somebody's face, up in front of them, to expose them to it, is a real insult. All right, how are shoes displayed? So here you are, showing in every one of your displays the bottom of the shoe. Sometimes Americans tend to be really relaxed when they talk, and they feel that this is kind of a good way to have nice rapport with people. And you know, you can sit like this or like this, and you can even get your uh, self off the uh, chair altogether. In Japan, this looks terrible. It's something that is not only offensive, but tells um, the Japanese you're speaking with that you have been poorly raised, uh, that your parents haven't corrected your posture, haven't helped you establish the physical balance that complements and enhances yeah, a spiritual right. balance that you should always be seeking. Just how you use your hands makes a difference. Italians talk like this, and they seem to think that Americans who don't use their hands a lot are uh, rather uh, cool or uh, uninteresting or bland. Whereas if you go to Southeast Asia, uh, just one sudden movement with your hand like that will uh, throw people off and cause them to feel uncomfortable in your presence. The basic rule which will hold around the world is observe how those people who are leaders, who are accepted, conduct themselves. Watch their style of communication, how they sit, how they use their hands or their eyes or how they place their feet and begin to adopt those ways. Back off a little bit and slow down and you don't have to... Be subtle and yet as a new person in town, you need to reach out. Nobody's going to come get it from you. I mean, they're not going to come to you that strong, a little bit. But then it's up to you to reach out, make your friends, reach out. And you have to do it gently. Certainly be respectful um, and attentive to the culture that you're in. And you can assimilate in certain ways that are natural and easy for you and make sure that you don't step on someone's toes. But um, you've got to be yourself, otherwise you'll be frustrated, I find. And also I find people are interested in who you are as an American. They want to know um, what's the latest slang or what's the latest dress or whatever. And, and you're a puzzle to them, so why not enjoy it? The fact is that cultures on the surface are changing every day and in momentous ways. People are wearing different kinds of clothes, buying different kinds of products, watching all kinds of new communication media and so forth. On the other hand, down deep, fundamentals of culture are, are moving at a glacial pace. 
They are very conservative because they are fundamental to the way people think and the way they feel. When you go abroad, if you think you've got the culture figured out because you know that you should bow here or not wear your shoes there or uh, keep your head below somebody else's head or something like that, that's not sufficient. It's useful. There are rules. Some of them are absolute. You've got to know those rules. But when you go abroad, you are like a child, an inquisitive child. And you want to learn what is going on in people's minds. Why do they do this? If we are conscious of the impact of our cultures upon us, then we can anticipate a little bit better people's reactions to us. And we approach them a little more humbly because we see they too are conditioned by their environments. Then we begin to ask questions, watch, watch very carefully, listen very carefully, and see why, why they do the things they do. There are real reasons, very logical, sensible reasons for the way they do things. We can begin to sense those, then we can connect with them, we can communicate with them, we can get the job done, which is our responsibility. But we can do it in a way that is exactly suited to them, to their situation.